Good evening, everyone. To those of you here at the impressive Zoological Society of London and those of you who are joining us online. And a very warm welcome to the second part of the Chagos Conservation Trust 2023 Annual General Meeting. Whether you're a member of the Trust, a trustee, one of tonight's speakers, someone who works with the Trust or for the Trust, or you're just interested in the work that we do, this is the first time we've really done an event like this, and apparently it's the largest turnout for a CCT AGM event, so thank you. And it's certainly a first for me. I attended last year's AGM, having just been informed that I'd got the job as director, so this is the first AGM event I'm hosting. So thank you all for being here to celebrate my one-year anniversary and to celebrate the Trust. 30th anniversary. So for those of you who haven't met me yet, uh, my name is Sarah Puntangalia and this is the post-AGM speed speaker event. So what does that mean? Well, it means I should probably hurry up with my introduction because the speakers will just talk for 10 minutes each on a different area of the trust work before um, we have a question and answer session. And that is questions from the floor must be directed to a specific speaker on what they've spoken about this evening. And for those of you online, you will be able to send a question via the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and I'll see it on the iPad and read it out. Um, and if you have a question on anything else, you know, grab one of the board outside at the reception. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our first speaker, Dr. Pete Carr, currently our project manager and an ex-Royal Marine commando who worked on Diego Garcia for five years, two years as the British executive officer and then three as a contractor's environmental director. His talk is an update on our key rewilding project, Healthy Islands, Healthy Reefs, which he leads on. And there's information about it on our website and in the, last, the latest edition of Chagos News, which is also on our website. But in brief, it aims to rewild the 30 ecologically degraded islands on the outer atolls of the Chagos archipelago, returning them to their natural habitat and boosting the survival of their seabird populations and supporting thriving coral communities. And you may have noticed that Pete isn't here physically tonight, but he has pre-recorded his presentation from the Chagos archipelago when he was there recently doing some training as part of the Trust's skill sharing commitment. So if, like me, you've never been to the islands, let Dr. Pete Carr's speech transport us all there to this incredible place that we as a charity are solely focused on protecting, preserving and educating people about. Good day everyone. Um, I wish I could be there with you in London at the AGM, um, but here I am in the Chagos Archipelago and presently I'm on an expedition with a group of scientists gathering data um, so that we, the Chagos Conservation Trust, can write the vegetation management operational plan. How to convert these mono-specific stands of coconuts into habitat conducive to bringing seabirds back to breed and roost. And if you have a listen and a look round, you can see the only sound that I can hear at the moment is the rustle of palm fronds and there are some red fodies, which is a ubiquitous introduced bird, um, twittering away in the trees. There's only coconuts growing here. This is what we call coconut chaos. The light at the top is suppressed, um, so nothing can grow underneath. On top of that, all the fronds drop, suppressing uh, any life down here. Uh, and all that's coming up through here are coconut seedlings um, and, and actually the coconut plantations grow because they drop them on the peripheries and as time marches on the plantations get wider and wider so believe it or not these coconut plantations coconut is a native tree out here but the plantation are unnatural and they're invasive so i'm now here getting data for the uh, vegetation management operational plan. What I hope is that I have the opportunity to go on to one of the flourishing seabird islands and show you the difference between these coconut chaos, these monospecific sands, and what an island with seabirds really looks like. And this is what we're trying to create. This is one of the rat free islands on the Great Chagos Bay. It's never been farmed for coconuts. 
therefore it doesn't have flat. And if you have a look around, there are natural coconuts along the shoreline. And if you look in the far distance behind me, there's a mixture of sooty terns, brown noddies, lesser noddies, pretty birds, and red footed blueberries. And this is the type of island that we are trying to recreate, we're trying to restore by going on to these islands that have coconuts and rats around the coconut plantation and rats, and restoring them so we can use an island like this because, as we now know, islands like this put nutrients into those wonderful coral reefs that are just out beyond us here, and those nutrients go further out into the sea. So not only do we restore the island, but we get healthier items and we get healthy roots. Well, that was very authentic, very handheld, but I, I think you got the idea there and it was great to see so many seabirds. So if you've got any questions about our rewilding project, grab me or one of the board during the reception. So. Our next speaker needs no introduction. Nigel Wemben smith is a former High Commissioner for the British Indian Ocean Territory, where the Chagos Islands lie, and the second ever chair when the Trust was in its early days and called the Friends of the Chagos, which makes him a rather fitting speaker for this anniversary event. So as the author of what is affectionately known as the Chagos History Book, published by the Trust, explores the archipelago's then little known history, tonight he introduces his new book, which tries to solve the mystery of where the Portuguese sailing ship, the Conception, got wrecked. So if you'd like to come and join us, Nigel. Well, um, there it is all to read. Um, I won't stop to ask the questions, but get those data. But if you, that's, that's the book, that is. It isn't with me now, because the printer, for reasons best known to themselves, um, said it's going to be ready, but it isn't ready, and I don't know when it is going to be ready. But it's a small book, um, A5 A size, only 100 pages, and that means that the price will be about 10p per page, a snip. Um, well, this book is what it says on the tin, and a bit more too. The story has fascinated me ever since I have encountered it in Richard Edis's Peak of Lemuria, which we all have read, and tracked down the Portuguese text in the British, British Library, and then had a go at summarizing the story myself in a 2007 edition of Chagos News. A fuller account is contained in the history, and finally I discovered, much too late, a French version, which I translated. I submitted my, t my text to a retired professor of French at London University, and she turned clay into silver. I really recommend it. It was long believed that the ship was wrecked on one of the islands of Peros Banos, but none of these islands matches the description given not only by the uh, this chap Manuel Wrangel, who wrote the story, but uh, not some moment later, we don't know how much later, not only by him, but various other survivors whom he could not have met between the shipwreck and their writing their version of the story. So they all saw it as a, t a small island, round, 100 by 160 uh, yards, and, and with a depression in the middle in which water gathered. Um, and as we explain in the book, we still don't know which island it landed on, because none of the island descriptions we have, either from the Chagos or from the Maldives, match up with this, what the, the, the survivor of the wreck had to say. But we had several guesses, and we invite you all to see if you can guess better than we can. However, I have to declare an interest in all this, because in 1984, during a visit to the Chagos, I was taken in a rigid inflatable boat to inspect Danger Island, that's down in the south, southwest. The surf swamped the boat, stopping its engine, and we were flung ashore, desperately holding on, bouncing up and down. It, it weighs 1,800 kilos. The, the coxswain told us, let go, and he was swept away, and, got, and eventually got the outboard motor going again. 
we wandered down the island for about half an hour or 40 minutes. And then I have no idea how he get back, got back on board again. But as far as I'm concerned, I always feel that I shared a little bit of the experience of the sailors in the Conchichao um, being flung ashore. And this island is one which possibly would come into play, but unfortunately I can't actually prove it. So I can't say I shared their experience. Another person interested in the story is Professor Philippe Sands, the eminent lawyer in a speech in autumn of 2021, he linked the event to the beginnings of slavery in the Chagos by referring to the discovery by survivors of the shipwreck of black men on the tiny island which the, where the wreck took place. I then shared with Professor my translation of the story, which showed this could not have been the case, and exposed several other errors. When Sand's book, The Last Colony, appeared last summer, this encounter was described simply as, ha as having happened later and elsewhere. That was indeed the case. As Manuel Wrangel himself makes clear, more than a month of sailing in his, in his makeshift raft around and about 20 pages of text Separated, separated the two events. Um, then there were lots of other errors he made which were left unchanged. They're still there. The last colony goes on to speculate on the early history of the Chagos and the origin of the name Peros Banos, coming down in favor of its being named, as stated in Professor Stan's speech originally, which I drew attention to, to himself, after a certain Pero dos Banos, connected in some way to the ship Conchichal and perishing in the wreck. As you will see when you read Wrangell's sad story, for yourself, I hope you'll do it very soon, many names are mentioned, but nowhere is that of Peros dos Banos, except as an island shown on the ship's chart. The least I can say is I try to help. I should also say a word about my co-author, Maddie, as... as well, until Man Madden is known to his friends, approached me about writing a, a blog based on Chagos history. Although he's an American citizen and an electrical engineer by profession, he remains fascinated by the history of Southwest India and his ancestry, which comes from Kerala, which is that part. We have yet to meet in person. We have found it very easy to work together I think it makes it such much sense for him to take the lead and put the, the arrival of Portuguese invaders into the context of centuries of Indian history and earlier invasions, which the book does beautifully. I, could, I really recommend that part of it. Um, he has also a deep knowledge of the structure and crewing arrangements of ships like the Conceição. That ship was a smaller one of the sort, but they all had... A, similar patterns of work, similar descriptions of the officers and crew, and all description, same way they perform their duties. So it's a fascinating account, which would be quite meaningless if you just read Bangle's account, which assumed you knew where everyone was at crucial moments. Anyway, quite likely then, the shipwreck story is not part of Chagossian history. Certainly it has no connection with the eventual human settlement of the archipelago. It does have a remarkable treatment of human courage and testament to it, and one which deserves much, to be much more widely known. So I counsel you, enjoy it, study it, and help CCT's coffers in the process. Thank you. and Nigel will be taking questions at the end. And if you buy his history book tonight in the foyer, I'm sure Nigel will sign your copy. And most people do not realise that we, as a trust, publish books. And um, Nigel's new book will soon be available to purchase via our online shop. And by the end of summer, Dr Carr's second edition of Birds of the Chagos will also be published by the Chagos Conservation Trust and for sale via our website's bookshop. It is improving things like our website shop, which made us decide to revamp the whole trust's website this year. 
But to tell you all about this project is Philip Hizdu, um, the director and founder of Octofin Digital, who websites, interactive maps, and databases for the conservation sector. Now, Philip has worked in conservation for more than a decade, starting here at and for ZSL, and he has worked closely with the Trust for the past seven years after designing our Chagos information portal. So please, can you give us a sneak peek of what our new website will look like and do, Philip? You? Good. Um, so I hate PowerPoint presentations as I'm a sort of interactive website kind of person. So hopefully this will kind of work. We'll see. Um, so yeah, so we've worked with the Trust um, for about seven years uh, with the former director, Helen, and now with Sarah and, and team. Um, we started the first project we worked together. I hope you folks have seen it, is um, the, the CHIP website, the Chagos Information Portal. So that is a database of um, sort of expeditions, a historical timeline, um, a encyclopedia of corals, birds, um, sharks. It's called fish, but it's just sharks. And uh, a really nice interactive map. I think we were meant to get to the other fish, but never got there. And um, we've got a really detailed uh, interactive map. It's one of we specialize in interactive maps. And this is one of the, my favorite ones that I've ever built because there's almost no land on it. And it was really fun to map because it just looks really weird and wonderful. So um, so that was, that was really fun. So we, we, we worked on this. And um, this project um, sat as a separate website to the main um, Chagos Trust website. And um, the idea was to get lots of traffic from that, explain what the Trust does, but also sit this independently. The, the problem was that the main Chagos Trust website sort of didn't really explain what was going on with the Trust as well as it could have. So you sort of landed on it and it said when the Chagos Trust, when it was established and had some pictures of starfish and various things on it. So where is Chagos? What is it? What does the trust do? Was quite buried and quite hard to find, as were any links to this wonderful website. Um, so what we decided to do is, uh, with Sarah, we've revamped everything. And uh, we've got a little sneak preview to, to work on. So my team have been working really hard on this. And uh, I think we've got a really nice design. Let's see if this works. So hopefully, if I hit next, we've got a little sneak preview. So please don't read content because a lot of it's placeholder. But as you can see, it's, I'll go through some better bits in a bit, but it's just much clearer in messaging what's going on. Uh, yeah, really, really clear. And um, like, what are we protecting? What's going on? What lives here? Where is Chagos? That sort of stuff. So I'll just wait for this to scroll. <laughs> Okay, so um, one key part of this is bold messaging about what, what this is. So uh, before, as I said, we had uh, Chagos Trust, established date, nothing else. So uh, unless you really know what's going on, you don't know what this is. So here we've got a really clear, clear messaging that the content will, like this is, content is subject to change, so imagery and, uh, and text. But the, the clear thing is you land on this and know where it is, what's, what's going on, what the trust is about. Um, there's also much sort of clearer navigation at the top, saying like um, where the support links are, where news is, what the archipelago is, what the, where, what the trust does, uh, that sort of thing. Um, another, another key part of it is to make it really easy to expand. So a lot of people, a lot of um, charities spend uh, a lot of money, build a website, and then abandon it. And then in 10 years time, it's like suddenly, oh, we need to pay lots of money again to build a whole new one because no one's touched this one in 10 years. So, um, so what, we've, what we've done is really like made a very easy to update content management system. So I'm sure Sarah will be hounding you for content, but if there's anyone in here who has anything to, uh, to supply to both this and the, the chip websites, so that's data, guest blogs, anything like that, it's it's going to be much easier to host this content on this and keep it updated. Um, so, what else have we got? Um, what's that? Yes, okay. So, uh, we've got, um, on the content side, uh, it's 
a, it's a difficult audience because we've got scientists who, who go to this uh, website who already know what's going on. We've got members of the public who maybe want to donate, become members, that sort of thing. And you've got journalists who want to um, get um, information on uh, what is quite a big news topic in the, in the coming years. So, um, so I think a key part of this is content strategy. So there's uh, Sarah and, and Amy and other people have been working on really good content for this. So there's going to be um, clear content that's easy to understand for, journal for newcomers who don't know what's going on, but also deep enough for sort of journalists and gateways to maybe not too much scientific information, but gateways to places like CHIP, which is more for collecting the scientific information, collecting data sets, that sort of thing. So we've got gateways to scientific information, either directly hosted, but also clear links to the information portal. Um, so we've got so much amazing imagery and maps, stories, other things like that, and the key part of this website is just showcasing all of that stuff. There's, uh, there is new content to be written, but there's also amazing content in Chagos News, other things that's just buried in PDFs and spreadsheets and other things that's just sitting around. And it'd be really good to use this website to, um, to highlight some of those. Um, so, what else have we got? So, um, there's some amazing work. We've already heard about, um, about work that's happened uh, and is happening. So a clear focus on uh, what projects are going on now, uh, new stories, people. Um, I think the not just this, here's a picture of a shark, here's a picture of a coral, but also the people that are involved, the, the scientists making the expeditions, uh, put faces to make every new story not necessarily be published by just the Chagos Trust, but put a face to it, because uh, there's some fascinating stuff that goes on. Um, and also calls to action to donate, become a member, and get involved. But maybe in a clearer way, maybe in a way where it explains why you should donate, why you should become a member, how you can get involved, rather than just the give us five pounds through a PayPal interface that doesn't really work. So, um, so yes, so that's, uh, that's there. So there's going to be uh, new stories. Uh, much At the moment, it seems to be uh, very much press releases and then Chagos News as PDFs. We're going to try and bring the news stories to feel much more like something that you can uh, embed, link to from social media, have listings for events, uh, events like this, in-person events, uh, work like um, seminars, that sort of stuff that goes on. So make it something that isn't just a, um, a database of press releases, but really feels like a news, news listing of what's going on. Um, so I mentioned guest blogs and richer content. Uh, we've got better sharing functionality. So there's some amazing work that Sarah and team have been doing on social media uh, to get uh, more people knowing about what the trust is doing. So ways of embedding the website uh, into those posts and linking, linking across. Uh, and uh, yeah, as I've mentioned, ways of highlighting years of amazing content, scientific achievement, and yeah, amazing stuff. So, yeah, it's launching sometime this year when all the content and everything is um, gathered. And, uh, yeah, happy to answer any questions on anything about how it works and what we're doing. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Philip. I hope you like the new look. We're really happy with it and, and all the work the team's doing and uh, the designer, Simon. Um, you know, it's, it's the first point of contact for many people with the trust, so it's so important that it... Um, is a fit for purpose, professional and attractive website. And we hope we get it ready by Christmas, fingers crossed. Um, so, staying on the website and skill sharing commitment theme, our next speaker, Pascalina Nellen, has been leading on the content management for a new Chagossian community website. And this is a website that the Trust helped create with some remaining funds from a Chagos Connect project, which together with ZSL, we did to, which was aimed to engage and raise environmental awareness with Chagossians so they could contribute to the conservation of the Chagos archipelago. But I will leave Pascalina to tell you all about the new website. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Pascalina. Um, I'm a member of Chegosian Voices. My grandmother is a native of Diego Garcia and my grandfather a native of Perez Banos. This was my motivation to join the Chagos and Voices team. So um, previously, I've got the opportunity to collaborate with CCT in some translation, and today I'm glad 
to manage the website with collaboration with the trust. So um, who we are, the Che Gaussian Voices. Che Gaussian Voices emerged in 2020. We are a platform comprising both independent volunteers and members of existing Che Gaussian community groups. The group was created with the aim of um, giving voice to the Che Gaussian community to support their welfare globally, to provide a forum for debate, and uh, to campaign for the community, and above all, to present precise and reliable information for the community. Che Gaussian Versus has been successful in securing a voice at the highest levels, both nationally and internationally. So um, I know that some among us, we do know who are the Che Gaussians, but still I want to briefly, uh, briefly de describe who are the Che Gaussians. Che Gaussians are an indigenous people, the descendants of enslaved people, and indentured laborers who live under first French and then British colonial rule on the Che Gaussian archipelago in the Indian Ocean. The Che Gaussians were forcibly removed from the Che Gaussian Islands by the UK in the late 1960s, early 1970s to make way to a US military base. So over the centuries, they became um, well-defined people with their own Creole language, music and culture, building a culture and way of life closely linked to the land and oceans of the archipelago. Che Gaussians are now based mainly in Mauritius, the UK, and the Seychelles. They have become citizens in the UK, Mauritius, or the Seychelles, depending on where, of where their enforced exile has ended. So um, I will elaborate on the Che Gaussian Voices website uh, in partnership with the Che Gaussian Conservation Trust, as you can see, you have an idea of the homepage. So the website was generated in collaboration with CCT, with support from the ZSL, and we website developers participation. It was launched on December three, uh, sorry, December 3rd, 2022 in Crowley. The purpose of this website are to provide the Che Gaussian diaspora with factual and up-to-date information to share community news, to celebrate community achievements, to raise awareness about the Chagos Archipelago for the wider public, to celebrate and promote the Chagos way of life and culture, to raise awareness and knowledge about natural environment of the islands. And the website is available in Creole and English. So how to access the website? The Che Gaussian Voices website can be accessed on the Che Gaussian Voices.org or through other Google search engine, you can uh, type Che Gaussian Voices and then you will get the website link. And it can comfortably be navigated in both English and Mauritian Creole versions. So why we choose Mauritian Creole version is because um, most of the Che Gaussians has, have been exiled in Mauritius and um, in the Seychelles, we do, the Che Gaussians who are, have been displaced in the Seychelles, we do understand Mauritian Creole, so it is easier for us to translate it in Creole, uh, Mauritian Creole. And um, what are the website contents? Things what we undertake. We issue a public and community platform for worldwide Che Gaussians. We arrange for campaigns and communications with public officials and the media, establishing networks between Che Gaussian community groups and cooperated with them to back their activities and objectives with organizations, individuals, and parties who can support the Che Gaussian community, researchers and academics who can supply corroboration and knowledge which will facilitate the lives of Che Gaussian, enhancing collaboration with environmentalists who help maintaining the Che Gaussian archipelago 
and the connection between people and the islands. You can also find latest news, any recent events concerning the islands or aid for community development, for example, the 40 million support package and our proposal on how to dispense it, the current negotiations over the sovereignty of the islands. We have our achievements, Nationality and Borders Act, campaign for UK citizenship for all Czechos and descent, and how we achieve this fruitful campaign, many meetings with UK government and numerous documents and case studies self-determination and indigeneity, campaigns for the voice of Czechoslovakians to be heard in matters affecting the future and the future of their islands, attendance at international conferences and the UN, prominent collaborations, Czechoslovakians Women's Welfare Fund, Manchester Czechos Archipelago Community Group, Czechos Island People, Seychelles Group, UK Chegger Support Association, CCT, BOTC Campaign, Blue Marine Foundation, Amnesty International UK, Human Rights Watch, and public officials. Successful awareness through participation at the 2021 Island Innovation Conference and addressing employees at, um, sorry, addressing employees at the Digital Specialist Marketing Mobster and employees at Rolls-Royce. Involvement in the editing of the Pretoria Declaration in favor of the Chagosian Islands in South Africa in 2022. Attendance at permanent forum on indigenous issues at the UN 2023, which will lately be updated on the website. Content also available on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. You will also find negotiation on Chagos sovereignty, many statements, meetings and letters with UK government departments, MPs and ministers, secured a letter from Chagos and Voices, along with other Chagos and community groups and independent community members on the issue to the UK government, the ways of how and to whom we communicate our concerns example of approaches through letters, through MPs as spokespersons in parliament, media coverage. You will also find Chagos and Voices and Hitler's contesting the validity of a hearing at this tribunal with regards to the continental chef dispute between Mauritius and the Maldives. Copy of letters sent to various officials and representatives at Hitler's is available as well as some articles on the subject matter. Also available discussion forum. The Chagosian community and the public are being encouraged to let their voice heard and to find about themes of discussion related to the Chagos people and environment. And lastly, you can find some useful links and also on different contents you will see backup links are available and also a space has been assigned for links of incoming, to, incoming topics. For example, facilities that will be made available for community development. And you can contact us. We have our contact information. You can see um, our email, um, how you can reach us through, the fa through Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Pascalina. Thank you, Pascalina. It's great to have a platform where not just the Chagossian community can get correct information, but also for the rest of us to learn more about the community too. Now, it's time to look at the science that is done in the archipelago and the beauty of the nature the Trust is working so hard to protect, including one of the endemic species that makes the archipelago so unique, brain coral, the world's rarest coral, with less than 100 confirmed sightings in the last decade. And who better to bring you up to date with the research than the person behind many of the sightings, Dr. Bry Wilson, a coral biologist from the University of Oxford, who is going to fill us in on the current state of his ongoing conservation efforts to save this iconic and enigmatic species. Bry. 
Well, um, it's uh, my first, uh, first CCT AGM and, and meeting, and it's a real pleasure to be here, and uh, an extraordinary honour to have members of the, the Chikossian community here as well, and, and see why this part of the world is, is such an incredibly special place for me. It's, it's the most beautiful marine environment I've ever been to, and, and it needs to be conserved. And, and that obviously isn't a discussion that, that we have with the members of that community. I'm really glad that you get to see why this place is so special to me. And in particular, it's um, this little coral. And uh, if there's anything more uh, charismatic than a giant underwater brain, then I, I just don't want to know. Okay, I know people talk about manta rays and sharks and whatnot. And, uh, and when, uh, when uh, the, there was mention of anything, any other business, uh, my business would be to actually uh, remove the turtle from the CCT logo and replace it with a with a the Chagos brain coral because there's turtles everywhere, but the Chagos brain coral is only found in one part of the world. Okay. Now um, this is a kind of classic view of uh, of the um, of the archipelago. This is Salomon Atoll, and you can see here this this extant volcano that would have formed these old coral reefs, and. Uh, and despite the fact that this place is so remote from anywhere and protected from a lot of the influences of, of human behavior, um, it still gets affected by climate change. And back in 2015, 2016, we had two of our hottest years on record. And they wreaked havoc on the coral reefs there. And in some cases, we lost 80% of some of those coral species. But the incredible thing about the Chagos Archipelago is that because it is so far from major population centers, that when those reefs are damaged, they bounce back almost three times faster than any other reef system on the world. And this really does show the power of actually leaving nature to its own in certain parts and, and making sure that areas like this are protected as a repository for, for corals for, for years to come. And this may well be one of the last reef systems surviving in a, in a future climate change situation. Now, when I first arrived and, and joined uh, Expedition out in 2019, I was told that this coral was essentially extinct and I, I wasn't going to find it anywhere. And then in something of a childhood dream, I, uh, on, on maybe my third dive up in the north of Peros Banos, I actually found two of these corals. And, and since I was about four years old, and I've been reading these stories of Jules Verne, finding these, these bizarre kind of mountain habitats with pterodactyls and God knows what, this is what I dreamed of doing. Um, I always thought I'd rediscover the thylacine, the Tasmanian tiger, and, uh, and I'm not saying that the brain coral isn't, you know, isn't up to that standard. I mean, it is, of course, and, and of course I'm heading to Tasmania next after this, because I feel like it's, it's a luck of the Irish thing, I think, that uh, discover these things. But when I actually dropped down, I, I found this, this coral for the first time in, in several years. And, uh, but it was a very sad shadow of its former self, and you can see here that essentially most of that coral has actually died, and there's just this little bit that's in the shade that's hanging on for dear life. And in fact, the other five colonies, I only found six that entire expedition, all looked very like this. This kind of little last bit that's kind of hanging on. And this suggested to me that um, there wasn't much chance that this thing was going to be around when I next returned. But of course, nature continues to surprise me. And, and when I, I did my first dive in, in March 2020 uh, and rolled off the back of this boat in uh, the northeast corner of Diego Garcia at Barton Point, I landed on this beautiful specimen here, probably about half a meter in diameter, maybe 10 years old. And the beautiful thing about this is, is that it's clearly survived probably the last three or four bleaching events. And so what we're seeing here is, is something that potentially will, will spawn future resilient corals that may survive these warming waters that we're seeing. Um, now, the Chagos Archipelago, as I've mentioned, is one of the most beautiful places in the world. Um, one of the real difficulties with working in the archipelago is the sharks. Damn, there are sharks everywhere, and they make science really, really difficult. And uh, this particular fella here was, wouldn't leave me alone and was constantly uh, swimming around in the background. And you can see uh, I had to constantly have uh, eyes in the back of my head. And in fact, you can actually get these mask straps that have eyes on them. And the sharks, uh, their brains are only this small, and they're fooled by things like that. So that's, uh, that's one of the things. And in fact, I think I have a ZSL mask that has something like that. Um, and uh, for me, um, and I, I talk about the, the archipelago as this extraordinary place of beauty, but um, there's one place in the archipelago that, that is more beautiful than any other, uh, to me in particular, and it's Middle Island, which is one of the, or Middle Brother Island, sorry, which is one of the three brothers. And uh, this is almost unique in the archipelago because it's a self-contained lagoon, and 
This is actually the first shot I ever saw from overhead, and this was only taken uh, in October uh, last year, and this was a drone shot we had. And, and I'd been um, essentially surveying these little reefs, these little knolls here, and I didn't actually realize there were more up here, and I didn't know this until we actually saw overhead. Um, this here is an extraordinary spot. This is a little uh, black-tip reef shark nursery. So if you go up there, you actually see little sharks about this big kind of swimming in the shallows. Um, and then you can kind of bully them uh, like they do when I'm underwater, the bigger ones. And uh, maybe that's why that one was chasing me, because I bullied it in a previous life. I don't know. Uh, and um, what's so special about this is it's very difficult to get into. And you can see here a very narrow channel. And, uh, and I led, I think, the last... Um, the last boat trip into this, and, and everyone was there going, well, he's been here before. He knows all about it. And I think I scraped the keel out of a boat on pretty much every coral bommie going into this channel here. It's a, it's a very tough navigation to get in there. But um, the most incredible about, thing about this uh, particular lagoon is it's the last, as far as I'm aware, place in the world where we can find this very rare coral in abundance. And uh, when I was um, out there in 2020, we, uh, we got the call that a, a novel coronavirus was, was coming out of China and that uh, essentially countries were closing their borders and we'd have to shoot back to the UK. Um, there were plans that we were going to go to Western Australia and uh, we were going to go through the uh, Suez Canal, which I was really up for. Um, but our Irish captain had been uh, captured by Somalian pirates or, or at some point and, and didn't want to go anywhere near the coast of Africa. So I was there saying, well, it's Western Australia, surely. But uh, then our uh, esteemed pres uh, president, prime minister, um, I'm mixing Trump and, and, and Boris up. We should probably edit that out in uh, the, uh, the actual uh, thing there. Plus, there could be people in Oxford listening to this, which is uh, dangerous for me. Um, so uh, our Prime Minister essentially uh, yeah, basically got us out of uh, the Maldives. We managed to get back from there. But on the very last trip that I had out, the very last time I was underwater, um, we were doing just a general survey of the reefs, and then uh, I saw down in the, in the depths one of these beautiful charismatic brains. And I started gasping through my air. And, and for anyone that's dived, you have this needle that tends to go very slowly, but this thing was, was, was going down at a rate of knots. And, uh, I, I, and, and usually you come up on, on 50 bar, so a quarter of your air, just in case anything goes wrong. And I'm going to get myself in trouble again here, but uh, I came up on about 15 bar because uh, I was so excited because after that one brain coral, I then saw another 14 or 15. And when I returned the following year, I counted 42 colonies in this tiny little lagoon. And this, as far as I'm aware, is the single greatest collection of this coral on this planet. Now, when this thing goes locally extinct, and I say when because at the moment it looks like it might go that way, um, then it becomes globally extinct. And, and that's the issue because it's only found in this one very special part of the world. And more impressively than anything, and I'm getting very paternal here about my coral, I found a baby. And this was probably less than six or seven months old. And the most incredible thing about this is that those corals are actually breeding in this lagoon. And that gives us a real hope for the future. And it turns out actually, oh, another great surprise. I mean, that slide surprised me. But uh, uh, on a dive at Il Parasol, uh, we found this monster over a meter in diameter, decades old. And, and every year, this thing would be throwing out baby corals that would be seeding the reefs around. And, and again, this would have survived many of the, the recent bleaching events and be a real uh, a chance for a future hope for this coral. And it turns out now that um, we've seen uh, members of this coral kind of in, in a range of places over the archipelago. Admittedly, kind of 20, 30 years ago, it was found everywhere. In fact, it was one of the commonest corals in the archipelago. And we don't have any idea at the moment why it's, it was hit so hard by recent kind of climatic events. And that's something I'm really looking into at the moment. Um, I did also uh, head off on expedition to uh, the, uh, uh, close to the, the masquerine, uh, Sayada Mala here. Um, the reason those spots are green is because this is uh, one of the world's largest seagrass meadows, which for people who are big into seagrass, I mean, that's very exciting, but uh, it was one of the most boring dives I've ever done. Um, I mean, essentially like diving on a flooded lawn. Uh, and if that's your thing, then, uh, then, then go for it. Take my place on the next expedition. Um, but in an expedition back in 1905, they actually found uh, many, many um, examples of these corals living in the Sayadamala banks. Uh, and so I was sent out there with the uh, express mission to see if we could actually find any of these corals out there. And, and, and unfortunately, I didn't. And so it still very much remains a Jagossian coral. 
Uh, and I'm quite happy about that, actually, because it gives it that little extra... Plus, I didn't want to change the name. It would become difficult then, and political. So, um, and, uh, and of course, this is where the Chagos Archipelago is in relation to this. And one of the things we're actually looking at is whether actually the babies of the corals can actually drift all that way across from the Chagos Archipelago to the side of Marla Banks, and will have done in, uh, in, in previous times. The problem, of course, now is that there's so few of those corals left that uh, the chances of any of those babies actually reaching that far west are, are very, very small indeed. Um, so I'm involved as well in the Red List, and for those of you who don't know, this is essentially a, a threat assessment program, and it, it assesses the, the risk of extinction of species around the world. And, and for the last kind of 10 or 20 years, uh, the coral has been at this stage here endangered. And, and due to my, my recent forays out there, we've now had to uh, upgrade it or downgrade it or uplist it, I think is actually the professional term, to critically endangered. And this really is kind of the last chance to try and save this coral because the next step, of course, is extinct in the wild. And, of course, the worst of all extinct where we have no living specimens left of this coral. We're also involved in the green list as well, which is a way of essentially finding how we might be able to conserve and save this coral and, and ways forward with that. And, and the big issue is, is that that's going to be a very, very difficult task because the area is so huge. Getting out there, as, as you may know, is extraordinarily difficult. And, and diving, I've mentioned the sharks, of course, um, diving is very, very dangerous out there. It's, it's, I mean, I love it for that reason. And uh, I mean, I feel like every job should have a, an element of death in it. Uh, to truly appreciate what you do. And every time I go out there, I'm feeling that this could be my last dive, but uh, it's a way I would want to go. And even though I said to my mother, it's the way you want me to go, she disagrees. But, um, and, and I said, it's okay, when they bite, you bleed out in about 30 seconds. I won't even know it. Um, it's also, again, um, uh, it's been focused uh, on by ZSL, and so it's actually what's called an edge species. And these are the evolutionarily distinct and globally endangered species. And actually, due to the, um, the, the concern, oh, I don't know if Rachel, has she run off? Oh, she's not here. So the wonderful work of Rachel has actually pushed this to the forefront of ZSL's kind of um, species uh, approach in the, in the coming years. And so there's a lot more focus coming on it from London Zoo, which is wonderful for my research as well. Um, I do it for free, but, uh, but bills need paying. And uh, so I do need some kind of salary. Um, and so I'm also looking at um, computational techniques and bringing this cutting edge stuff, you know, because if you say to the grant agencies, we're just going to go out there with a tape measure and a camera, they go, well, do you really need a million pounds for that? And I go, well, you know, it's, the flights are expensive. Um, but actually, some of the things we're doing is actually uh, we've got video footage, and I'm doing this with one of the Darwin Awards that went out there. And we have these, uh, this video footage from all the way around Diego Garcia. And we're actually going to train um, computers to spot these. And, and, essentially, uh, and, and, and essentially tell me where they are. I say computers, but um, I call them graduate students. And uh, we, we use the graduate students first, and then they train the computers. Um, the difficult with uh, graduate students is they have rules and regulations. Uh, computers don't yet. Um, so, um, and employment laws, which are a real issue to deal with. Health and safety as well. Computers don't have any of that. Um, and this, again, is, is one of the, uh, the species. Yeah, and this is Tanella on the, on the reefs of uh, Diego Garcia. This is me. Um, diving down there, and I'm, I'm taking essentially a little uh, thumbnail of the tissue here to, to work and look at the genome, the recipe for life. And one of the reasons I'm doing this is I want to find out exactly why this coral's been hit so hard. And uh, I just discovered only yesterday that it has a, it has a, a, a symbiont, a little, uh, a little plant that lives inside it that's very different to other corals. And this plant actually allows it to um, photosynthesize or, or to collect energy from the sun at much, much lower levels than other corals do. I don't exactly know what that means yet. Quite literally, I'm fueled on adrenaline and wine when I discovered this. So uh, um, I've got to sleep properly and, and, and get back to this. But uh, yeah, as I delve into this kind of recipe for life, I'm going to find out much more about this coral. It's going to enable us to, to hopefully conserve it and save it. Um, also with Ken, a big shout out here uh, from the Natural History Museum, we have uh, a lot of old kind of fossil, well, mummified, I suppose, uh, corals that were taken over a century ago. And, and hopefully with Ken, we're, we're going to work on, on looking at these and, and seeing if these corals have actually changed in the last century. The planet has become a very different place in the last 100 years, certainly the temperatures that we're seeing. And so what we might actually find is that these new corals are, are adapting to these new kind of um, temperatures and situations. Um, and so hopefully with, with uh, some of uh, Ken's incredible expertise in, in working with these much older specimens. And, and I mean, Ken is a much older specimen than I. And so, uh, in that respect, uh, it's, uh, I say much older, I mean, slightly older, Ken, I mean, slightly older. Uh, and so it works out beautifully in that respect. It works on a number of levels. You know, the young coral, the juvenile, essentially. 
and, and well, anyway, you know what I'm getting at. Um, and uh, of course, uh, with my, my colleagues at the Hornby Museum here, in, in the audience here at uh, ZSL, one of the big things that we'd love to be able to do is, is bring back, somehow if possible, some live versions of this coral um, before it's too late, and, and essentially have them here, maybe in London Zoo and also in the Hornby Museum. And if we can actually save this coral and, and, and breed it, um, there's a potential that if it is lost in the wild, we may be able to return it to the wild. Um, in this last week, we've seen that uh, El Nino, which is this incredible kind of weather system that hits uh, fairly regularly over, over the, well, certainly more regularly in recent decades, we're, we're due to get a really, really bad one uh, coming up this year. And every time I hear this news, I think maybe that last time I was out there was the last time I saw these things in the wild. And so every time this happens, I feel like maybe we've missed that chance to save this coral. These are the people that have made that possible. Uh, most importantly, I suppose, would be the Bird Ready Foundation who, who, who pay my salary and allow me to do something I'd do for free and actually uh, and, and, and earn something from it. Um, and uh, if anyone has any, um, any questions or anything like that or wants to reach out, please get in touch. This, by the way, I should explain this very quickly. Um, do I have time? Not really. Right, no I'll go. I mean, that's as good as a yes, isn't it? But. Uh, the schools that rip through the time. I mean, it's a beautiful place to be, but my God, the storms are brutal. And um, this one had washed that beautiful green T-shirt I'm wearing, which protects me from being sunburned. Uh, I, I inherited from my father. And uh, one of these storms swept in, and, and someone told me my, uh, my shirt had been washed out to sea. And, and that was my emotional response. But the guy that said that was joking, and he actually had it. And so the next photo, which I don't have, was me hugging him and kissing him um, in, a, in a very emotional... They're emotional trips, I think. But... Um, Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> Thank you, Bri, for an inspirational as ever entertaining talk. Um, it's no wonder some people affectionately call you the next David Attenborough. Um, well, they do, yes, they do. With the world's reefs in such a state of accelerating decline, it's never been more important to draw the world's attention to their plight. So thanks for all the work you do. And also thank you to the team at London Zoo who hosted some members earlier today with Charlotte. It was Charlotte, wasn't it? And um, for showing us around the tanks. Um, another charismatic speaker <laughs> is John Slayer, who will close this evening's event by showing us some images and footage of the Chagos Archipelago from the past 30 years since the Trust started. And it's John's images that you see all over our website, our social media, and Chagos News, which we're very grateful for. So John was introduced to the Chagos whilst working there as a Royal Marine Commando in 2005, where he hosted the first major science expedition since 2002, and he bought his first underwater digital camera. This proved a great combination, and since then, he has been working to bring emerging photogenic, uh, photographic technology to capture the beauty and the richness of the natural environment of the territory. So John, please come and tell us more. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm going to try and condense 17 years of photography into uh, a few short minutes. So bear with me as we canter through this. And um, I'm also just going to pop a timer on so I can keep, keep tabs on where I am. Right, so uh, as has been said, uh, I started my underwater photography journey in around about 2006 in, uh, in seriousness with the convergence of two very fortuitous things. One was the advent of digital cameras, and the other was the arrival of Charles Shepard uh, on an expedition to the Chagos in 2006 when I was working there. And um, I just bought myself a digital camera and an underwater housing, and Chris Davies, who's in the audience, uh, gave me the go-ahead to host the expedition, with the result that I spent three weeks in the outer islands alongside the scientists, taking a digital camera underwater and just doing what I did with the digital camera. And this is one of the things that I captured. My very first manta ray underwater at a cleaning station just off the Salomon Islands, and it blew me away. Suddenly, I was taking things which I'd only seen in David Attenborough documentaries, and I was excited by it. In addition to that, I also 
got to take some stills photographs with this uh, digital camera. I spent about 20 minutes on the same dive around this uh, uh, large anemone trying to capture this little baby anemone fish and managed to capture this shot of a tiny little fish in a forest of tentacles, which also, uh, uh, this really excited me that I actually now had something in my hands that I could capture the beauty of the Chagos with. So um, a couple of years later, after I'd left Diego Garcia, I uh, still had the passion for underwater photography. I still very much felt a connection to the beauty of the Chagos and wanted to share it. I knew that the administration was not interested with the military base in having civilian photographers out there. So I came up with a plan anyway. I took it to the Foreign Office and I just said to them, look, here's a plan. If you ever need footage of the Chagos, you know who to call. Put it on your shelf, let it gather dust until you need it. And uh, pretty much let it go. What I didn't know is that the Pew Environment Group, uh, Alistair Gamble and uh, uh, the Bertarelli Foundation uh, were working with the administration to try and create the world's largest marine protected area, which came about in 2010. And when the government decided that they were going to do this, they realized, hey, hang on a minute. We don't actually have any images of this fantastic place we're about to, to preserve. Uh, got on the phone to me. And I ended up on the other side of the world because I was in Central America at the time. Uh, I think Alistair will probably remember the phone call uh, a short while later and hired the most up-to-date camera I could find that is a weirdly shaped camera housing because inside is a camera which uh, for the first time was recording not to digital tape, but to memory cards, which were about three inches long and an inch wide and probably held about exponentially less than your micro SD card in your mobile phone. Uh, nevertheless, we got some fantastic footage with it, which um, we put into videos to go alongside the declaration of the MPA and uh, Again, just the opportunity to be out there. The administration only gave me five days out there. I spent 20 hours a day working on capturing this stuff. I was up at 4 a.m. on a boat out to the islands at sunrise to capture the terrestrial wildlife as the sun came up. When the light was bright enough, I was straight into the water. Three 90-minute dives in a day to capture as much as I possibly could and cram in as much as I possibly could. Back onto the islands at sunset for the afternoon light come dock, straight onto the boat, download all the footage, process it, just about make it by midnight, into bed, back up at 4 a.m. the next day. Just really wanted to get as much as I could, not just underwater, but on the islands as well. Pete Carr alluded to it. Uh, he couldn't actually do his videos in the hardwood forest because of the cacophony of bird noise, but this is what those hardwood forests look like. They're absolutely stunning. It's like a cultivated garden just perfect uh, on those islands and of course you've got a rich really rich plant life you've got a, a, an amazing diversity of little insects and creepy crawlies and then the king of the islands the coconut crab as well and I wanted to capture all of that so these videos uh, I submitted uh, not only to the um, uh, uh, release of the MPA but also to a few film festivals and um, uh, went to attend one of them where the films were nominated for an award in uh, Monterey Bay in California, the Blue Ocean Film Festival. And there was introduced, uh, amongst others, to, uh, to Google, who had created Street View a few years before. And at this festival, we're la launching Ocean, Google Ocean, the water side. They'd done great with the land. They hadn't really covered the, the earth, uh, covered the water. So, and they wanted video content to... Um, uh, complement their, their new platform at Google Oceans and obviously I had a lot, load of video to go with it and that kind of branched away into something else as well. Um, they had those cars traveling around capturing street views, they had a backpack version of that to go to places where there weren't people and there wasn't infrastructure and of course the Chagos was a prime candidate for this so we ended up getting street view of the islands which you can still go into street view view and, and look around. And as, as I understand it, that's actually been hugely useful in um, initial botanical assessments and habitat assessments for restoration. So it has proved to be very useful. But you can see the, uh, the 30 kilogram backpack and two massive pelly cases that I often had to swim ashore over the reefs. Um, 
Between 2010 and 2016, I attended probably about 12 expeditions to the Chagos, each time adding to the library of footage and, and stills. It's easy to capture the big stuff, but when you get that sort of time to immerse yourself, you start to, to notice the little details, like Nudie Branks, this colorful fellow on his pink perch, uh, less than an inch long, and this tiny little Sauron shrimp, just ludicrously colored, one of my favorite photos in amongst the Possilopera coral. Other thing that we want to capture, obviously, is the, uh, the scientists at work. You can see Pete Carr doing coconut crab assessments, one of his uh, initial baseline studies, which contribute to the Healthy Island, Healthy Reef, what, what has evolved into the Healthy Island, Healthy Reef initiative, and, of course, scientists going underwater there in uh, Peros Banos Lagoon. What I haven't mentioned yet is, of course, the seabirds, very charismatic, this uh, adolescent booby giving me the beady eye to the camera over there. I love this portrait. And um, of course, all of that has utility. Uh, we managed to make the front cover, cover of Nature when Nick Graham, who create, uh, assessed the link between the health of islands and the health of reefs, his publication went into Nature and we managed to get the front cover with this beautiful portrait of a nesting red-footed booby uh, in front of a sooty tern colony in the north of Peros Banos. Uh, I also wanted to try and get street views underwater. I tried to create my own system. Hand-mounted, six GoPros, very cumbersome. Awfully difficult to try and figure out it all out after that. Didn't really work. Uh, I got the Kaplan Seaview Survey out there. Their system on an electric underwater scooter costs about $20,000 just to get started, and the logistics were a nightmare. Um, but as it was, technology kind of overtook uh, the both of us because the last time they sent me out with uh, that backpack, 30 kilogram backpack, as I was walking out the door, they said, oh, and take that with you, that's the replacement. <laughs> A little uh, handheld 360 consumer camera. Took one picture with it, realized I was getting better images than that took and immediately wanted to take it underwater. Had two weeks until the trip, managed to come up with the prototype housing, which we managed to get to work out there, sent all the images off to Google, and four months later, they got back in touch and said, hey, do you mind if, we, uh, if you make some more of those for us to distribute around the world? And uh, the cogs started turning, and we realized that we maybe had something that we could uh, go ahead and move forward with. Could you play the uh, 360 video now, please? Okay, if you can just manip manipulate the screen a little bit. So, We've moved forward with technology in the intervening six or seven years, and we're now producing a much better um, uh, product than we were before. Uh, that actually, you know, 4K resolution 360, you can pick out individual species, you can pick out individual polyps in the corals. Um, this is a really amazing observational tool, and you can properly immerse yourself in, in the environment. Um, so that's is where some of the, uh, the, the kind of Chagos work has, has led. Um, this is from the Maldives. I haven't actually managed to get one of my new systems out to the Chagos yet, but certainly the aspiration is there. Can we swap back to the presentation? Thank you. So um, where are we moving with this? I want to get street views underwater out in the Chagos, add to the library. Um, uh, we can draw freeze frames from those 360 videos and actually create street view content from that. The resolution is good enough for that. And the next step along as well is real-time observation. Uh, we have 360 video systems in 4K that we can live stream through the mobile data network, through the satellite data network. And this is in the Maldives, our broadcast 4K 360 through the mobile data network in the, the Maldives. And you can, of course, do the same thing um, through things like Starlink uh, data now. And you look at the economies of it, how much does it cost to get an hour's worth of uh, diver observation underwater in the Chagos? Imagine having one of these systems underwater uh, for daylight hours broadcasting seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, we are installing one of these with Force Blue, the charity that I work with, which is going to be involved in the Healthy Islands, Healthy Reefs initiative when it goes ahead. Um, we retrain special forces Military combat divers uh, repurpose their diving skills to help out with coral reef and marine conservation efforts. 
They've got a coral reef restoration program just off Miami, and we're installing one of these uh, live streaming systems two miles offshore, broadcasting through a surface floating buoy into the uh, mobile data network over there. Um, so really, what uh, I'm here, what all those efforts have been for is to share the beauty of the Chagos over the years and looking forward, that's what we'd really like to do is share the beauty of the area. And this is the image that I wanted to leave you with is this fantastic Acropora garden, which is absolutely one of my favorite spots in the Chagos. Thriving, plethora of fish life, amazing corals, and just absolutely stunningly beautiful. And I'll leave you with the still of it. So slightly gone over time, I apologize, but uh, there you go. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Your footage and images are just incredible. And um, John's got more of his videos on his YouTube channel, John Slayer, uh, as well as the Chagos Conservation Trust YouTube channel. Um, can we just give all our speakers a round of applause? Um, thank you to all of them. Now, if I can ask them to come back on the stage, we've got time for a few questions. Um, so if you want to just, let me just move your hand. Questions. So Danny's here, so if you raise your hand, we can take questions from the floor. And also, for those of you online, um, if you put a question in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen, I will be able to read it here. So does anyone have questions for any of our speakers? No? This one. Sorry, I don't think you're surprised I'm going to talk to you now. Go ahead. Go on. <laughs> um, from your map of the Chagos Islands, how much of that map has actually been surveyed diving? Um, because obviously you have the sites that you found the Tanella, but how much has actually been uh, kind of surveyed already? I think the rough estimates are less than less than three uh, percent. It's it's yeah it's it's and so I'm not suggesting that that those it's it's not found elsewhere. We just haven't had the time to get out there. It's the, the diving conditions are really restrictive, as, as John will say. In fact, I'm desperate to go back through all your footage now and see if I can find it, maybe with graduate students, I, do. I think. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, 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 it's just very difficult to get anywhere, and anything we do out there is, is so gratefully received. But yeah, it could be anywhere. And, and yeah, I mean, the, the reefs, we, we are only allowed to dive to 25 metres, and potentially this coral can grow to 45 metres. So there are some of those deeper reefs. It might be hiding out as well, but... Um, who knows? Well, I'm focusing all my, my eggs on, on middle brother because uh, it only gets down to about 10 metres and you can basically snorkel that. Um, although last time I was there, I, um, I, I had a terrible thing where um, you, you, when you dive, you dive in pairs. So if anything goes wrong, that there's someone there to save you. And I, I took a, a group of, of seven out. I was leading a group of seven. And so I sent six, uh, six people off and said, just look out for each other. And I went off on my own and, and of course, came around the corner to a, a four metre bull shark. Mm -hmm. And I realised that was my uh, that was my comeuppance, and that was the longest surface water swim I've had to get to, to get back to the beach ever. But uh, yeah, it um, yeah it's it's it, it's a dangerous place to die, and, and so we do what we can. But yeah, it could be there could be so many more out there. Thank you. Any other questions? Question? No. no more. You can give a remark. <laughs> you caught me with that question. I, I, I think can explain. I think yes. I can explain. Uh, on one particular dive on an expedition where I was, uh, I think, buddying Charles and Anne Shepherd, uh, we dropped into the water. Uh, I think it was inshore of Eel Anglaise in the Salomon Islands on one of the coral knolls in the lagoon and uh, happened across an octopus and then saw another octopus and uh, started filming them and then realized that I might have been uh, interrupting a, uh, a bit of a session and uh, proceeded to spend the entire dive trying to film said session and uh, it did end up online and yes, it's still there, Nigel. <laughs> okay. So if there's no other questions, um, 
I just wanted to thank tonight's speakers, again, not just from me um, and the audience, but from all of the Chagos Conservation Trust Board. Um, I'm aware that I'm standing between you guys and a glass of wine, but I quickly want to also thank you all for attending this evening, both in person and online. There's still time to become a member by joining up with, with Chris here, our membership secretary in the foyer online, uh, or buy what's left of the books. You know, I've lugged them all the way from rural South Wales, so you'll do me a big favor if you buy them and I don't have to drag them back and you can also donate. And uh, a final thank you from me to all the board um, for being so welcoming during the past year. You've really made it so enjoyable. Um, thank you to the trustees who have helped tonight. Um, Alistair, Rachel, and Steve Cole, um, who presented the AGM. And also Rachel Jones, who's sadly not very well, left us, who most of you know works for ZSL, for allowing us to use this amazing venue and her endless help with, uh, with logistics. And also Ken and Chris for manning the tables and, and greeting you all, and especially our new trustee, Amy Wilson over there, who's been an invaluable support to me on all things digital, including making sure you all got your invites and those of you attending online got the link. And our chair, Dr. Natasha Gibson, is really sorry to not have been here tonight to meet you all. But as Steve said in the AGM earlier, um, she had a family emergency, had to go back to Australia. But I know, hopefully she's watching, and she'd really want me to thank you all too. So let's go to the foyer, let's have a drink together, and let's toast the Chagos Conservation Trust and its work for the past, and hopefully the next 30 years. Thank you.